All right, well, uh, let's get started. We have a lot of questions about uh, the Virginia militias and militias in general. So this is our Libertarian Crusaders episode number 34. And today we have Brian Robbins of the Virginia militia, uh, which is great here, local. And what a time to be talking about militias. <laughs> what a time to show all these people who are always talking about preppers, uh, you know, who's, who's laughing now, right? Everyone's rushing to to the gun store. Um, and now they're seeing like the importance of having guns and organizing and getting together with like-minded people and realizing that uh, in, the, in the state of things with looting and all that rioting, that the state can't protect you and it's going to have to be again up to us. Um, could you talk a little bit about your project, uh, Brian, about the Virginia militia and how you uh, together? Yeah, very good. So, um, First of all, it should be understood that the Virginia militia uh, and militias in general are extremely decentralized. Um, they're local people acting locally. And so um, my, uh, my website, my page, the whole thing, that uh, the project that I've been trying to build is, uh, while it's called the Virginia militia, it's not something like some big official organization like when somebody thinks about the National Guard. You know, There are no top-down orders. But what we're trying to do is build um, a way to help provide resources for militias and to provide the um, uh, um, basically kind of messaging, branding, things like that for militias. Um, but primarily what we've been working on is organizing, bringing in new recruits, connecting people in their local counties, making sure that everybody is being able to find the people that they need to find in order to organize, because that's the most important part is that the militias um, can gather together with people around them, because that's what a militia is. If you're just sitting at home and you've got guns and you don't know how to contact the person who's gonna stand next to you, then you're not a militia. That's not what it is. So I, I started this thing um, just a few months ago. I think it was February, perhaps March, when um, all that the, the two-way sanctuary counties were going across, you know, it was sweeping the state. Then we went to Lobby Day in Richmond, and I think a lot of people had an awakening then. They're like, this is what the militia is. I mean, when we were there, there it was palpable. We could tell that we, the people held the power. Um, the police, I think, were completely afraid to act. Everybody at that time, I know it's difficult to remember, at that time, masks were illegal. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, everybody was wearing masks because it was freezing cold, and the cops basically let it happen. They didn't care. They're not going to you know, tell a guy with an AR strapped to his chest with 10 of his buddies around him to take his mask off or get on the ground. That's not going to happen. And it didn't happen. And so I think the, the power dynamic there was clear. And we all, so many people who are now organizing militias realized that, um, hey, there's that lost part of the Second Amendment and of Virginia, uh, you know, Article 1, Section 13. And maybe we should revive that. And uh, so at that point, I, I connected with some people that had put together like a, a, uh, re a resolution to start militias in their counties, just like the Second Amendment sanctuary resolutions. So I presented that before the Board of Supervisors in my county. And uh, we talked about it. I talked about it with boards of supervisors, members and everything. I was organizing with people to try and get them to pass this, just like we were building momentum for the 2A sanctuary. But um, basically every county, Board of Supervisors that had that resolution presented for them turned it down. They turned it down for various reasons, but it basically all comes down to mm, cowardice or something like that. And so from that point, we said, okay, well, I guess we got to do this ourselves. Uh, we can't just uh, accept that we can't defend ourselves as a people because our Board of Supervisors says that they're not going to muster the militia. And so from that point, I started started a website. I started organizing people. I started gathering people around. I started connecting with people in other counties. And now we've got, um, you know, hundreds of contacts, perhaps thousands of people that are involved across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, dozens of counties that have an actual a leadership structure that have uh, recruits. Uh, we've had meetings. We've had uh, all this stuff. And uh, I think things are going really well. And certainly, all, remember, all this happened before COVID-19, before the coronavirus, before riots, before anything. And so it was really an important time to really get started with that. Because if we had decided to go, get started now, I think it'd be too late. 
the militia has already been defending communities, buildings, and people uh, against these rioters and and uh, protesters and everything. So, and we're just getting more and more interest, particularly right now. That's basically where we are. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's an amazing work that you're doing. Very important work. It kind of goes down to like the history of Virginia. Uh, I know back then it was a compulsory in which uh, people here, colonists had to meet once a month for a monster and to make sure that they had their armaments and everything and that they were there for, for training. Um, I think that compulsory aspect of though, uh, I guess for them that's survival because at the time you're you're going through the French Revolutionary War you're going through a lot of Indian tax there's, there's just a lot of warfare going on so I could understand that but since it's changed to a volunteer force since um, I still feel like it's, that's still something you can say to kind of bring back that importance of like Virginians to be a Virginian you should go to a muster at least once a year for example uh, own a rifle or a gun um, if you can't get one, contact your local, local militia groups to help you get one and to do some training with that. Uh, kind of like in a way people always talk about, uh, what is, is this Switzerland where everyone there has training in terms of, uh, being armed and, uh, Hitler's general once told them like, yeah, we, we can take over the country, but you won't have an army in the end. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the kind of, uh, right. thing we want when people hear about Virginia the federal government, yeah, you guys will, can't try it, but you won't have an army in the end, right? So back then, it, 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 during the colonial times, I think their conception of the militia was slightly different than what we conceive of the militia being today. And quite frankly, the militia has been um, a non-entity for so long. We're just rediscovering what the militia is. Um, but back then, you know, they, they had specifically in Virginia Article 1, Section 13, says no standing armies. And, uh, and so the defense force for the state was the militia and men of a, you know, of a particular age, 16 to 55, who were trained to arms were expected to be called up by their governor if necessary to defend basically against Indian invasions, foreign invasions, and things like that. I mean, we haven't really been invaded by foreign forces since then. So, and the Indians aren't a problem anymore. <laughs> so. Domestic forces. Yes. Right. So it was, it was essentially, it was essentially this, the domestic defense force, kind of like what you would think the military would be serving the purpose of today. Of course, the military doesn't serve those, that purpose either. Um, you know, they're off overseas, fighting overseas, not defending the homeland. So today, I think we need to recognize that the enemy that we're fighting is, or, or that we need to defend against, is not an outside force. It's not an outside invasion. It's an inside invasion. Um, it's a, basically an insurrection of ideology. Uh, and, um, you know, there are so many people, you remember at the Richmond rally, and there are so many people that have this mentality where it's like, from my cold, dead hands, um, I will not comply, we will not comply, things like that. But if you intend to not comply, and you intend to only let them take your guns from your cold, dead hands, then you better have a militia. You better be ready to stand and, um, you know, get together with your people, or else you're just going to be slaughtered. You'll be kid killed in the middle of the night. Um, you know, at four thirty a.m., shot through your bedroom window. Um, hey, so, it sounds like you're referencing something specific there. That is very a specific reference. Yeah, exactly. And you know, he was trying to get involved in the militia too. Yeah, and more of a tech, like a tech way to network people. And uh, one of my questions is, like, in hindsight, do you think it's better to not have the board of supervisors or any political entity involved? Because it gives you more of an agility, more so than having government uh, as a middleman would. Uh, yes and no. So the Board of Supervisors would have been helpful for legitimacy. Um, and remember, this is the entirety of what government rests on, is legitimacy. And so to get them to kind of confer that legitimacy onto the militia would be really great um, in order to gain recruits and stuff like that. Um, they, the board of supervisors also wouldn't necessarily have control over the militia, but there have been counties, for instance, Bedford County, they have a really great relationship with their board of supervisors and their local sheriff. They were able to get their board of supervisors to pass a resolution to recognize the existence of the militia. It wasn't like a muster, uh, thing or organizing the militia, but they just said, we recognize you, you have the right to exist in our county. And now 
Sometimes they get called up, particularly with these riots, and they've actually defended buildings, pre prevented buildings from being burned down, and um, um, acted as defense forces already. Yeah, Pete Buttigieg had some comments uh, about two years ago, and I believe he said something along the lines of, you know, nobody needs an AR-15. Uh, how are you ever, what, what reason would you ever have to have one of those weapons of war? Um, the government will just, you know, take you out or something along those lines. And I mean, all you need to do is look at the events of the past week and, and see it and think, there's a ton of guys out there who were standing out in front of buildings and just saying, uh, you know, I support justice for George Floyd and you're not, you're not coming into this building either. <laughs> so it just seems like, you know, this is an act like clearly the cops are completely overtaken. They, they can't handle this. This is another reason for a militia. Right. Absolutely. So the cops can't be everywhere at all times. I don't think that, very many people predicted that we would descend into this kind of unpredictable chaos where, you know, just a, a group of communists who nobody knows about could crop up over here and go and burn down a building. I mean, there's no amount of intel or police work can get you to know what they're going to do and go, you know, go and stop and prevent it. And the police can't respond fast enough to things that are happening all over the city. So um, you know, just doubling your force by having a militia is obviously a benefit in a situation like this. But this is probably something that Pete Buttigieg never thought would happen. Uh, and of course, his intent was uh, the most disturbing part about what he said was that he was like, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll drone bomb you, <laughs> which is a great reason to have an AR-15. <laughs> right. <laughs> and have our own drones. <laughs> right, exactly. I'll just start building my houses underground. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like this. That's one of the questions I ask to people that want to join the militia in my county is I say, well, you know, what weapons or what arms does the Second Amendment apply to? And if they say all arms, I'm like, all right, good go. You're in. Because <laughs> some people, they don't fully understand that. Floods. <laughs> this, uh, shall not be in French. Do you not understand? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I do like uh, Article 1, Section 13. Uh, I think that's something we should go through. Um, I'm sure you've, you've all read it through that. Yeah. I'm going to go through that and uh, translate what it all means for us. You I, want me to translate what it means for you? Well, I mean, like in, in general, because I would say like this, super, what supersedes, um, does a constitution, is that supposed to supersede the state or the state constitution supersedes the federal one? You know, that's a complicated question. <laughs> so there's the supremacy clause, of course, but that says that the law, laws pursuant to the Constitution of the United States are the law of the land. But then we also have, you know, the compact theory of the union, the states are independent. So it's hard to say. Um, and I don't really get into that. I think that the, the militia is extra political. It's, it's not a political institution. Right. Even in the Article 1, Section 13, even states, like, again, uh, the right of the people to bear, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And this is in 1771, you know, so this is before uh, the Bill of Rights and everything. I think they borrowed, I think that's what it is. They borrowed what the Virginia Constitution had created and mm -hmm. transplant that uh, federally. Um, you know, I always like to say Virginia is going to lead <laughs> this country towards their freedom. The history was born and created here. And eventually it'll be up to us again to show how we can escape through the statism and towards a path of liberty. Um, so yeah, I think um, section 13, I don't, I don't know if anything there I would amend or change. It says here that, uh, that standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty. Yeah. That's not, that makes sense, right? I think uh, it's better than the second amendment. Right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> and that in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. But at least they differentiate standing armies mm -hmm. and militia, because there's this debate sometimes that they like to say that they're the same, right? right. One's uh, state uh, soldiers uh, and the national. Other, right. Uh, but here, they in the very beginning of the census, they say like that a well-regulated militia, right, composed of body of the people, and then the next uh, line, they'll say uh, the standing armies in times of peace. So they acknowledge they're two separate groups, mm -hmm. right? One's from the state and one is of non-state actors. Mm -hmm. So and that alone should eliminate the argument thinking that this is supposed to be a state professional uh, 
composed of uh, an army under a state, for example. So I, sh I think that the most important part of Article 1, Section 13 is how it describes, um, it says that the, uh, a well-regulated militia necess being necessary to the security of a free state are... Am I am I saying the Second Amendment? What's yeah. what's this one? Read it. Read it out loud to me. Well-regulated militia, composed of the body of the people, trained right. to arms, is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. Therefore, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Right. So that I think is the most important part of Article One, Section Thirteen, and something that I think has been completely forgotten from uh, a right to bear arms standpoint. Uh, and if you look on the, the NRA's building, they have half of the Second Amendment. It says the right of the people to keep and bear arms. But I believe that both Article 1, Section 13 and the Second Amendment, they included the militia and they specifically say that the purpose of the individual right to keep and bear arms is so that people can be in the militia. So the people can organize and become the militia. Um, I think that the two are joined. And in the past, you know, when you argue with leftists or something like that, and you, we didn't understand the militia, and we said, well, I have an individual right. And they said, well, no, that's for the military. Look, it says the militia, that's the military. But they're wrong, and so was the person defending it. The right of the people to keep and bear arms is so that they can be in the militia. So if you are, if you care about liberty, if you own guns, and you're not in a militia, then you're only fulfilling half of the duties of the Second Amendment. Mm. Yeah, the concern w was always the uh, the way that early in the United States, they were able to kind of organize these militias and then turn them toward the ends that they wanted. Like there, there was some government power over them. And I think more and more we in, you know, in the liberty movement kind of think of it as, oh, no, this is our thing. You know, we're not reporting. So in the sense of board of supervisors or whatever, like if, if you actually could get called up during rioting and the board of supervisors votes, to, then it's like, Oh crap, now I got to show up to something. Uh, it's a duty, but I, it turns out I butchered that, uh, but Pete Buttigieg tweet, he said, uh, if you want an AR because you picture yourself using it against the quote government unquote someday, dot, 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 please pause and reflect that this fantasy entails shooting American soldiers and police officers. And I just thought that was, I just thought that was funny given the latest events where you got the troops getting, <laughs> you know, like insurrection act and uh, you know, you got the police militarized and everybody's, so I don't know. It's, and you've got uh, communist rioters that shoot a 77 year old police chief in the chest as he comes out of retirement to defend a pawn shop. Right. I mean, who's the one shooting cops here? And it was a, you know, a Bernie Sanders supporter who showed up at the Republican baseball practice to try and murder them all. Right. I, I mean, I, the amount of yeah. delusion that these people have is astounds me. Yeah, I think um, like the history of this, com Virginia Defense Force, I guess the original militia is still around. I had no idea. Just kind of looking at <laughs> yeah. uh, they've, they've been around since uh, forever ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're and they apparently they're branched off into different kinds of uh, squadrons or something, or um, I don't know what you'll call them um, all across the state. I think there's like five of them. Um, so that's so that's something. I guess that's like uh, I don't. I guess they do re report to the governor uh, themselves. How, how has the uh, cooperation or interactions been with uh, Virginia Defense Force in terms of Virginia? So we have not cooperated with the Virginia Defense Force or the. Um, National Guard. Now, the, the Virginia Defense, Defense Force is like a couple hundred people at best. And um, the National Guard, of course, is a much larger organization. But uh, that's something that we haven't talked about. It, I think it was um, Section 44-1 of the Virginia Code kind of outlines the structure of what the militia is. And the militia, broadly speaking, is made up of three different organizations, which is the, the Virginia National Guard, the Virginia Defense Force, and the unorganized militia. So this is what the third one is the one that we're concerned with and that everybody kind of thinks of when they think of the militia. It's regular people who are trained to arms, that organize with their buddies um, and they're the people around them. So they don't necessarily need to have like communication between one another. Now, you know, obviously if we were living, living back in the olden days and the Canadians invaded or something, then we would probably all be called up by the governor and organize with everybody and 
and all would be hunky dory. But obviously, that's not the situation that we're in today. And uh, very likely, the governor, if if ever anything would happen, <laughs> the governor would try and organize one half of the militia, the <laughs> National Guard against the other, the unorganized militia. That's why numbers he, is so important. I went to uh, a ham radio event called Frost Fest in uh, Richmond here, and I noticed that Virginia Defense Force was set up at a table and uh, they had a bunch of posters and stuff. And, and I just thought it was interesting. You know, it, it looks like you're, per, you're going to be joining something interesting. And then you probably just like have to fill up sand, uh, bags of sand, you know, and mm-hmm. during floods or something, which I mean, that's good. You know, that's a good thing to do, but uh, why not just learn to do that and a bunch of other things too, you know, with uh, Virginia militia. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're ready. So the, or Air Patrol that does that already. So it's kind of weird that those kind of objectives overlap. Well, yeah, and they probably serve uh, ham ra- or radio communication purposes as well. But who knows? You know? Right. <laughs> I, for Air Patrol, that was a fun experience uh, growing up. Uh, I never took it too seriously because, like, I can't uh, really follow. The, I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't salute another kid. That was just weird for me. I was like, dude, you're just like you got. Some of them get really upset because they're so gun ho about it. And like, they're supposed to have like these officer ranks in it, but I'll do it all of this, but I just, I wouldn't salute any of these kids. And I was like, dude, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a year older than you. It's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, this, this isn't going anywhere, but I joined the military later, but I wasn't going to take silver air patrol to the seriousness of that level that they wanted to kind of go all the way for. Um, but I think those kinds of great organization are something like the boy scouts. So kind of aim for be more towards, um, I don't know, what they do these days in terms of like farm training and something like that. But it seems like they're falling apart. It seems like something new should come in and take its place in terms of like exploratory and adventures and militia training for, for children and kind of bring that back in terms of it used to be just um, a regular thing to bring your, your rifle to school as a kid, not that long ago in this country mm-hmm. and kind of, I don't hate the word normalize it. Um, rejected the modernity and fear of guns and bring back the tradition of uh, rifleman ownership and training and respect for the firearm. Yeah. I think we have a long way to go before that can <laughs> happen, unfortunately. Um, so what does it take to uh, be in a militia? What, are, what were some requirements uh, you would have to be a part of uh, your militia? So, um, legally, the requirement is that you're between the ages of 16 and 55 and that you're trained to arms. And that's basically it. Um, and that you're a resident, I guess. It doesn't even say citizen. You don't have to be a citizen. You just be a resident. So, uh, that's the, the only legal requirement. But in practicality, you know, the, these things are built by people that show up. So, if you care about liberty, if you um, are predisposed to action and you show up, then you are in the militia. Now, um, if you want to find your local militia, one, you can go to uh, uh, thevirginiamilitia.com. Um, there's also some other great websites or, or like um, virginiamilitiaalliance.com, I think is their website. So that's another way to try and connect with your local people. And uh, yeah, go on. Did you yeah, have to- created this uh, great website in terms of... Uh where other militia groups around the, the, the state can come together and converge and share ideas and start their own groups in there, right? Yeah, exactly. So the website is kind of like a social media thing, a uh, social media website. It's its own thing. Um, I, you know, I, I'm sure that at some point, Facebook is just going to ban the word militia. They're going to delete all, all these Facebook groups. You're not going to be able to talk about liberty on there, particularly like if, if shots start firing, that's for sure what they're going to do. It doesn't matter what, who fires the shot. If the government kills a guy and it, and it turns out he's a militiaman and then a hundred militiamen show up at the police station or whatever, Facebook is just going to, they're going to ban it all. So we need to have a place where we can organize that's censorship free um, and that is built specifically for the militia and not for sharing cat videos and the militia, right? <laughs> so that's what the website is. And there's a group, there's bas- it's kind of like a Facebook group, but for every single county. And so uh, leaders can take control of their group. If you're a leader in a particular county, we've got a lot of leaders in there. If you're a leader in a particular county, you can take uh, control of the group and you're basically a moderator. You get to invite people, you can accept people who request to join. And then if you're, um, 
let's say you're, you're in Augusta County or something, and you're like, I don't know where to get started. How do I contact my militia? You go to thevirginiamilitia.com and you look up Augusta County and then you join the group and then you're in there and uh, you can now see who your leader is, co- you know, connect with people, talk with people and organize that way. Um, but, you know, the other way that people organize and, and try and find their militia is just basically through Facebook. Uh, you search for your local Facebook group. It's a bit more complicated because you look, well, let me look up uh, sheepdog people in whatever county or 3% such and such or whatever. And there could be a couple of groups for your county that have five members and you don't know what to do. So what I'm trying to do is like make sure that there's one place that people can go to that where they can uh, organize. And that's what the website's all about. What do, you, what do you think about like sizing of particular, you know, how the military, I'm, I don't really, under, I, you know, I wasn't in the military, but two of these guys were, and uh, there's battalions and platoons and what have you. What do you think is the ideal like group to be working with and spending the most of your time in a militia? You know, like, yes, I may be a part of the Henrico, but I'm, I've got this little group of eight people and we're really committed and we work out and shoot together, you know? Mm-hmm. So that would be a fire team. And uh, your fire team is made up of, uh, basically you're separated by people that are local to you, that live near you. Um, because, you know, if you need to respond quickly and you all need to rally at a point, you can't have the guy across county uh, drive 30 minutes to, to try and save your butt, even if he's your best buddy. I mean, he'll be there in 30 minutes, but you need somebody that'll be there in five minutes. So um, we, we kind of try and have a similar structure as military. So you have those, the fire teams of local people that um, will be more likely to meet and even like have a cookout or something like that. And then it, go, you know, it branches out from there. Uh, but it's not like a super militarized command structure or anything like that. And it also differs by county. So some people do want to have that uh, strict military structure. And there's a lot of ex-military guys uh, in the militia. So it all kind of, it, it, it's varying degrees of, of that sort of thing. Right. We did our uh, first uh, Ron Paul militia muster at the gun rally. And we might do another uh, gun training probably later at the end of this month. Just shoot out some land now that things have kind of cleared up a little bit out there. But uh, that, I will say our next official one, you should come join us is Anarchon uh, located up in Winchester. And it's the only campground that I know of that I've, I've done an extensive church finding that has uh, they now just open up a second firing range on site. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, I had a friend brought like a 50 cal, uh, a barrel rifle out there and just, I mean, that bullet is like the size of your hand uh, and the impact of that when you, when you shoot it, but it's an uh, outdoor range. Uh, great experience to me with a lot of other people from all over Virginia. Uh, it'd be great for you to be there. And if you like to do a militia talk there as well, uh, that'd be great to have you um, on there. Please send me an invite. That's not too terribly far away from me, Winchester. Yeah, it's in, uh, I guess, 14th to the 16th. Uh, great camping opportunity. We've got Joshua Dial from uh, the Tiger King is going to be there. Uh, Spike. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Oh, my gosh. What a fun oh will be gosh. there. Uh, I guess now we can get um, Hornberger to come out there and shoot with us. Uh, he, he made a promise that he'll go out shooting with us. So it'd be great to pull up really men into one of these militia groups soon since he lives. That's great. Right. Yeah. You know, we need uh, mainstream advocation of the militia. And I think it's becoming more so. And that's that's also another thing that I really tried to do with my organization is that, I mean, just think about last year. Was the word militia something that you were even allowed to say in public? I don't think so. It, it didn't seem like it to me. Um, it, it seemed taboo. It, it seemed synonymous with white supremacists, according to the culture or whatever. And so I was like, okay, I mean, obviously the militia is a real thing. It's something that we need to have back. It's in the Constitution. So we should just use that word. And so there are a lot of people out there, I think, that are, have been afraid to use the word militia. Um, but we need to start saying it. And that's why I, why, why I called the, the website and the page, the Virginia I was like, this is the militia. People are looking for this. This is what they, they need. And we need to say it. And on that website, you have a picture of a building. What is that building of? So, well, I don't have the picture of the building anymore. I actually changed it. 
<laughs> but it's still on the Facebook page. Right. So the building is the uh, powder magazine in Colonial Williamsburg. And it was basically the flashpoint for the militia movement or what you might call it back then in 1775, 1776, the governor sent troops, you know, tensions were rising in the colonies and the governor sent troops down to the powder magazine, which was a public, um, basically a publicly owned building where they kept all of the powder and all the uh, shot and muskets and everything so that people could defend themselves against attacks. And at that time it was Indians basically. So the, the governor sent troops down, uh, royal troops, and they stole the powder in the middle of the night out of the powder magazine, out of that building, and they absconded with it and put it on some royal ship and, you know, disappeared. And so the people in Williamsburg um, kind of rose up and they formed militias and uh, they sent troops to Richmond to go and question uh, Governor Dunmore and see what, you know, what this was all about. And so that was kind of the beginning of the American Revolution in Virginia. And it was only two days prior that uh, Lexington and Concord happened. And mm -hmm. Virginia didn't know that yet, but that's when that happened. And so in Virginia, that building is extremely important for the revolution. Yeah, there's always been a history. I mean, I, I've read a little bit about the, uh, the IRA in Ireland and how they, they did not have militias. Uh, by any stretch and nobody owned guns and everybody was very poor. So their only way of getting guns was actually just to raid whatever local government armory or battery uh, was down, was down the street. And uh, that's a very high risk activity. And it, you know, some luckily for them, I guess they, they managed to succeed, but uh, you know, it, it, it's just, so you can only imagine, like, I can only think that if they could just see what we have here in the United States, they would have been so uh, envious, you know, to say like, wow, so you can just buy whatever you want online, have it shipped, you know, and, and keep it in your house. And uh, yeah, you and a couple people can just like work, you know, work on this in your spare time. <laughs> yeah, for, for who knows how long. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. Uh, look up uh, better weapons and better gear and have it sent to your local FFL dealer and uh, have it picked up from there. We don't have to kind of risk our life trying to raid the armories of uh, these military units when which like these weapons that they have, um, it's not, it doesn't belong to the soldiers themselves. They're recycled. So after that is used by the next person after you leave, for example. Um, so like better to maintain it and take care of it and be able to take it home instead of having to turn it to the armory. Um, I think it's a much better experience um, to have versus back then. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Unless uh, Kurt and John have any more questions. I was just going to say, like, do you think that if we bring back the militia, it might uh, up the responsiveness of government to our grievances? So as you said, like, in Williamsburg, they sent the militia to question the governor and say, hey, why would you do this to us? If we had a type of power like that, do you think that that would bring back a sort of accountability in a way? Well, first of all, you premised your question, if we bring the militia back, and I will say that the militia is coming back right now. Right. Um, you know, Bedford County had 400 people show up to their militia muster. Uh, Campbell County had 250 people show up to their militia muster. And so many other different counties have had hundreds of people or lo just lots of people showing up to their musters and joining their local militia. So we are coming back. We're having the militia renaissance right now. But I think that that is the ultimate goal, is that in the future, uh, what we need to do is we need to have politicians sweating through their shirts as they sign legislation, um, thinking, what will the militia think about this? Um, will I be able to get away with this? You know, and plus, like they did out of Midwest. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. And, you know, their politicians were showing up with bulletproof vests because they were scared of the guys with guns, the militia. And then they canceled the session. And it would be better if our sessions were canceled more often. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they get to legislate a little bit less. So, yes, absolutely. However, I think that. I think that what we're coming up against is um, not necessarily a reform in government. I think that we're kind of coming to an end 
of the system of government that we've had for so long. I mean, it slowly transformed, of course, during the progressive era from a republic to a whatever the hell we have right now. Does it even have a name? And I think that it's coming to an end, quite honestly. I mean, you, you feel the tension. You feel what, what exactly is going on. I mean, how do we come back after this incident and pretend that the governor didn't, become an, didn't turn himself into a fascist dictator and just rule us all around, shut down our economy? Uh, you know, how do we pretend that that didn't happen? And how do we say that we, that can't happen again? If he did it once and he got away with it, then it can happen again. All right. He's very, he's very quiet lately. <laughs> Yeah. At least we know that uh, we come out in mass on the streets uh, that they won't put uh, like in the first couple of days. Like I had a friend compared to like the amount of guns that they pointed at us at the rally on the very first day, state of emergency, everything in lockdown. But the lack of response to uh, the first two nights of the rioting and the looting and the burning um, was, you know, completely different. Right. One side that. I uh, expects for us to show restraint, but at least we see, I think, uh, what happened on the 20th uh, helped others across the country through to grow some balls and be a lot more uh, proactive in those kind of measures. I think next year on the 20th on gun lobby day, people think that it's a one year thing. It's it's a, it's an annual thing here in Virginia. Yeah, <laughs> that moment is going to be even greater and a lot more interesting things are going to happen on that day and pushing back and seeing that the government couldn't restrain what is happening in the last week, then we kind of see then what we can get away with and push for uh, to kind of stop a lot of these ceaseless uh, tyrannical legislation that they attempt to push through. Mm -hmm. um, I think so, if, the, if those protesters that past week could just see what it was like walking through Richmond with, you know, ARs and, and people just armed, they would like of the past week, they'd be like, wow, I'm joining like that movement. You know, I'd much rather be a part of that than I would rather be a part of this. That is, you know, totally ceding ground um, to the government and asking for government to do things for me, you know? Right. That is a group that is, if you walk with them, you're walking with a group that has walked and marched against you and trying right. to arm you and take away your guns. All right. It's not about uh, just police justice. So for them, it's also about gun justice uh, and disarming you. So it's, they're not uh, particularly your ally in the sense of the term of towards the direction of liberty that we want to go. Yeah. So uh, let me say, are we about to go? It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Last thing so I want to say. Right. So let me say that um, when the left, you know, tells their people to jump, they all jump in unison. They're all on board 100%. And when the right says you need to join the militia, then, you know, sometimes the right will hem and haw and be like, well, I don't like that word and I don't want to scare anybody and yada, yada, or I'm busy. If that's the attitude, we're going to lose. You're going to, for a hundred years, we're going to live with whatever this society is that the left is creating for us. The only way for us to defend ourselves is if we join together and, um, you know, put all that baggage that you have behind you, join the militia. Join the militia. It's what we have to do. Politics is no more, no longer a thing. Voting is not going to save us. You have to do this. For those watching, check out thevirginiamilitia.com. Sign up. Join, find your local militia members. Uh, here in Richmond, we got the Ron Paul Militia Group here as well. Uh, thank you so much, Brian Robbins, for coming on the show. You're, if you've been delightful, it's great to talk about guns <laughs> and militias uh, for almost a good hour. Uh, with those watching, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns, not money. <laughs>